Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our program tonight. Uh, we're going to have a conversation about artificial intelligence. Um, we're here with uh, Anthony Chow. Dr. Anthony Chow is the director and full professor at the School of Information at San Jose State University and has been working in the library and information science field for the past 24 years. His areas of expertise include technology integration, leadership and management, information seeking behavior, and analytics and informatics. As the head of the largest MLIS program in the world, an academic advisor and expert in information science, Dr. Chow is also grappling with the current and future impact of AI in all aspects of society. We're really pleased to have you tonight, and um, uh, we will uh, do Dr. Chow's talk, and then we'll have uh, time for questions, comments, and conversations. So with that, I'll leave it to you. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Ryan. And I want to thank uh, Palo Alto City Libraries. <laughs> I want to thank Paul Alta City Libraries for uh, inviting me and, and, and including me in this very important discussion. And good evening, everyone. Uh, we also have uh, YouTube Live, and we also have uh, a virtual reality. I just wanted to show you kind of the mixed reality environment that we are uh, using as well. And I think this certainly is uh, very relevant to the talk tonight in terms of what exactly is reality uh, and the different uh, variations of that. The slide deck's also in the QR code, so feel free to take a picture of that if you're interested in the slides. Uh, and I'm sure uh, maybe post it on the website. Yeah, we can do something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, so let's go ahead and look at what we're going to talk about. So we really have three topics. Um, we want to talk a little bit about what AI uh, looks like in education, some of the things that we're seeing, some of the issues that we're addressing. Uh, tech is tech, so being in the technology field for most of my career, uh, let's talk a little bit about kind of what we can expect out of any type of technology in a brave new world. Um, I think a lot of people, including myself, really believe AI, uh, if properly used and cross-checked uh, with a lot of checks and balances, uh, is going to really push us to new levels, both in terms of uh, its ability to study, identify, and help us solve problems. All right, so let's start with the definition. So what is this AI thing? What is artificial intelligence? So Russell and Norvig uh, are considered uh, some of the original uh, pioneers in terms of defining uh, what uh, uh, AI is. So they um, have four potential goals, and they divide it into human uh, approach and, and, uh, and, and uh, machine approach. So first of all, the human approach AI is a, a system or systems that think like humans. Uh, AI is a, a systems that act like humans. In the ideal approach, system, uh, AI are systems that think rationally, and AI are systems that act rationally. And of course, I had to ask ChatGPT. So what did ChatGPT think about uh, AI? Can you turn the volume up a little bit? Uh, uh, you, uh, <laughs> I have to speak louder? <laughs> you want me to speak louder? Yeah. Okay, I'll speak louder. I, I <laughs> oh, no. Okay. <laughs> the the uh, audio you're hearing uh, there is in virtual reality, so, yeah. Um, so, so ChatGPT, uh, he promised he wouldn't heckle me. This is my, <laughs> this is my father, by the way. <laughs> uh, so ChatGPT says, uh, artificial intelligence, often abbreviated as AI, refers to the simulation of human intelligence and computer systems. Um, and I'm not going to read the rest of that, but feel free to take a look at that. So uh, ChatGPT, uh, um, uh, earlier conversation I had with ChatGPT earlier today. In particular, understanding uh, natural language, recognizing patterns, and making decisions. Uh, certainly, that is a, a transformational technology that allows us to um, uh, read and recognize and identify patterns that simply is beyond the human uh, capability. So, and so, let's introduce you to ChatGPT. So. Um, So you can see here uh, this interface. I'm using the free version. Uh, and um, let's just ask it for writing a, let's see. And 
and because of our technical difficulties, <laughs> which is the interwebs, uh -oh. <laughs> uh, uh, ChatGPT is uh, not online uh, and will not give me a thank you letter for uh, uh, thanking our, our babysitter. Um, uh, but this is the interface for ChatGPT 3.5, and um, what I had done is just prepared uh, one of its uh, template responses was uh, thanking your babysitter, uh, and that, you know, obviously uh, writing a thank you note uh, is a good example uh, of, of how you could use uh, ChatGPT. By the fact that I can't uh, communicate with ChatGPT because of a poor internet connection <coughs> uh, is also a, a, an example of, uh, you know, a potential limitation with AI uh, because I cannot actually communicate with, with ChatGPT at this time. So, and I didn't really mean, thank you, Ryan, for demonstrating that, that limitation, uh, but... <laughs> That, that is indeed a limitation. <laughs> of course, the other uh, irony is, uh, is that I'm, I'm offline completely, so I'm gonna go offline as well and just use my, my uh, PowerPoint. <laughs> Do you want us to try to help you get back online? It's okay. It's, yeah. Uh, it's okay. Uh, yeah. You're not involved anymore either. I'm not? Okay. Yeah. yeah. All, all right. <laughs> so, so we don't mean to demonstrate tech, technology failures, but uh, obviously uh, the internet is the key to all of this, and if we don't have it, uh, uh, then it... It's okay. I think for the, yeah, for the sake of, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about uh, AI and education. So um, in usability and user experience, uh, one of the primary concepts on how anything is used is what we call pool's principle of least effort, uh, which means that the easier it is, the more it is used. Um, that is important because um, the use of AI, uh, the use of AI to plagiarize or write full papers uh, is a known issue, uh, and uh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up my my nephew in a, in a little bit about how you know, how proud he is that he uses AI to write his papers, uh, and of course there there are a lot of challenges with that. So the point is is that because it's easy when you have internet, um, <laughs> we know a lot of people are using it uh, and not using it appropriately, right? So that's a huge problem. Number two is cite your source. So uh, as a faculty, uh, San Jose State, as uh, most faculties. And institutions are doing. Uh, we have come up with a, a policy which basically says you could use AI, we understand, we expect you to do that, but please cite it, right? Please do not plagiarize it. Uh, and so uh, the way I view AI is like uh, a lot of information resources, uh, you just must cite it, right? Cite it as you use it. It's yet another data point uh, for uh, information. Uh, another huge issue is validity and also equity versus inclusion. So um, the question I have for the audience uh, is uh, how many of you have anything published? Not, not you, Dr. Hirsch. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you do, right? Uh, now, the reason why I ask that question is because uh, a, a very serious equity versus inclusion issue is that if AI can't access your thoughts, in your ideas and your values and your experience, uh, when I when I can use AI uh, in ChatGPT, it's not going to pull those up, right? So you will not be part of that uh, data set. That's a huge problem, right? And of course, on the flip side, uh, what resources is ChatGPT and AI actually using, right? Uh, how many citations do you need? What university are you from, right? So it's a huge problem. Right, uh, and, that, and that, of course, is very troublesome. Uh, number four, uh, individual human ideas versus machine learning. Uh, so as an educator, uh, we ask you to write those painful papers because we want you to think, and we want you to write, and we want you to read, and we want you to, and all of those cognitive things happening in your mind is a, is a pr uh, precursor to learning. And if you go back to principle number one, and now I'm going to talk to my about my nephew who bragged about writing his paper the night before using ChatGPT, how much did he actually learn, right? Uh, and I, I, I imagine uh, that in, in higher education and at each level of education, we're going to see more and more uh, lack of preparedness uh, because of this uh, trend 
uh, in, in uh, uh, ease of use with uh, uh, generative AI, ChatGPT, and other AI agents. Um, and again, uh, what that means is a lot of the traditional learning is going to be missing, right? And I think that's going to be a very big problem also for us. Now, on the flip side, AI increases speed and quantity of productivity. So actually, I just wrote a book chapter for Dr. Hirsch. Uh, and I, I had AI, uh, ChatGPT, help me with uh, some initial ideas. Uh, and that really was very helpful when you start to write. Uh, and so uh, and AI uh, increases our speed and pro productivity uh, because it, is allow it allows uh, us to uh, have uh, quite a bit of information that in the in in the past we would have to write ourselves, right? So that's a huge, a huge uh, benefit. Number six is also very worrisome, which is the integrity of peer-reviewed research. Um, so, uh, I gave a talk a couple of months ago uh, where um, we were uh, looking at the closed captioning for Zoom, uh, and uh, you you guys have probably seen it too. Uh, Zoom based, the, the closed captioning in Zoom will insert words into uh, the closed caption even if it can't understand what you're saying, right? So it basically says, it inserts something wrong, in other words, right? Now imagine, and I'm sure it's already there, imagine in our peer reviewed research, those type of mistakes make it in there. Right, and we're citing Alfredo and 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 and, and Ryan and other people, uh, and half of it's wrong, right? And now I publish it, and so now it's considered right peer-reviewed research, uh, and so that is a huge problem. And of course, the minute peer-reviewed research is now called in the question, uh, the quality and validity of our information is very, very uh, troublesome. So I think. Uh, I'm very concerned about that. Of course, one of the, one of the, the typical things we like to do is uh, ask uh, AI, uh, AI or ChatGPT to write something about us, and half of it usually is wrong, uh, and we, we're, much, we're much better than we actually are uh, based on AI. So again, peer-reviewed research, uh, and that, that, the sanctity of that, I think, is definitely in serious jeopardy. All right, so tech is tech. So uh, my my beginnings was, or it was always actually was education, uh, and so <coughs> but technology quickly became uh, a very important resource that I that I had to use for that purpose. So in preparation for, I guess it was an omen. In preparation for today, uh, again, ChatGPT ran an error, right? So could not could not compute. Sorry, uh, and so this is important because. One of the truisms in technology that I've always learned is that it's going to fail. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, right? And so again, when we think about ChatGPT, uh, so we are in talks with UCLA and also San Jose State's academic libraries where they're really excited about using uh, AI to digitize and interpret uh, a lot of, you know, really the backlog of, of uh, printed documentation. Imagine if it starts making mistakes, inserting words, inserting citations, inserting dates that are all wrong, and they're not caught, right? Uh, and so again, the safety of that is, is very troubling. And so tech is tech, so that means it's going to fail. So as we use AI, we must make sure we have checks and balances, right? So in other words, we have to have AI checking AI, in other words. and we and. Uh, the good news is that this actually emulates uh, a lot of uh, uh, academic research where, of course, we have to use multiple resources, right? But definitely do not over-rely on AI. Uh, at this point, do not trust AI. Uh, make sure that you're always vetting uh, AI. The other is sanctioned misinformation. So the minute it makes it into the academic library at UCLA in San Jose State, <laughs> right? <laughs> And it's wrong, it, it becomes sanctioned, peer-reviewed misinformation, right? So that is a huge problem. Uh, and of course, the other part about technology is that uh, a lot of people like to use technology for good, and a lot of people like to use technology for not so good, right? And so again, sanctioned misinformation uh, where, uh, and I don't know, uh, I, don't, I haven't heard of an example of this where some type of AI uh, is used uh, to, delib to deliberately use uh, or insert misinformation, again, is a huge problem. So incorrect information, over-reliance on AI uh, is definitely something to avoid. 
And finally, the good news is that, again, the, the more and more I see how AI is being used, it is certainly another data source. Uh, and the general rule in, in uh, research is uh, you want to triangulate your findings, right? So make sure if you're using AI uh, that you use a lot of other resources to, to uh, vet what AI has just told you, right? Or what ChatGPT has just told you. So make sure you triangulate your data. AI is not uh, the panacea, and if you over rely on AI, uh, at this point anyway, uh, you're going to uh, be, uh, you're gonna run into some trouble. All right, and then finally, a brave new world. So on the flip side, AI, a generative AI, ChatGPT, it allows us to process, interpret information at uh, un unforeseen levels. So uh, AI empowers humankind. So the ability to account for multiple variables and resources at the same time uh, really, again, supercharges our ability to seek trends, identify trends, Microsoft, uh, told me, I don't know, a couple, I guess about a year ago, that they're using AI to um, take all of the, all, all books, uh, and particularly the classics, to identify themes and create visual patterns uh, of those classics. Amazing, right? Because obviously, as humans, we could not do it at that level, right? So I think it's a, that's a perfect example of, I think, the, the very positive use of AI. Imagine what we can do if our students are actually reading the material, uh, uh, using the classics and, and, per, and identifying themes that we could then teach uh, in education. Two, we can identify and solve problems uh, that we have not been able to do before. Uh, and so I'm very optimistic uh, that a lot of the problems that our, our world is facing, AI is gonna give us a much better chance of trying to at least understand the issues and identify potential solutions. Three, work and production is accelerated. So certainly in academia and, and most other uh, fields, um, the bottom line is we're able to do more uh, and do it faster. Uh, and so the implications for that I think is very positive. Um, and uh, again, I think we're going to see uh, amazing uh, innovation uh, and, and new technology and really new quality of life. Um, I was at a, a presentation uh, recently where, um, so AI and, and costing people's positions is, is a very real issue. Uh, but at the, the conversation was using AI uh, and robotics and, and, and innovations like that to actually improve the, li the quality of life of the workers, right? In other words, as AI and automation continues to increase, uh, we could actually, or, or uh, businesses could actually use this technology to ensure that the quality of life of the workers themselves is at a much higher level. And I thought that was a really fascinating yet emerging area, right? So number four, um, AI systems and VR in physical rea uh, reality merge with robots. So you already, I'm sure, have heard of the different types of AI-driven robots that are created, uh, and uh, those are only gonna get better. We also are working in, a, in, in number five, uh, a project called Seeking Mortality, uh, where we are digitizing um, Northern Cheyenne elders, uh, both in terms of language and their physical representation, right? We call it Seeking Mortality because, again, the grand, the, the, the end goal is, uh, is for those individuals to uh, be able to talk to their ancestors 50 to 100 years from now, right? Um, and, what AI does is gives us a conversational agent. So it's not just a recording, but rather it's a conversation. And so I, I really do believe that that type of digital um, preservation is something that we're gonna see more and more of, right? And I, I as a father, uh, looking at my parents here, uh, you know, I think the idea of, of having some kind of uh, a virtual representation uh, after our physical form is gone is, is, is optimistic and something I think we should do. Uh, and I really do believe, again, libraries uh, in particular can play a role in that because ultimately um, I, I, I hope to see that for all of us, right? All families, um, all, all cultures. All right, so final thoughts. Um, AI is another tool. Uh, it, is, there's, there's, it, is, it is incredibly impressive, incredibly dangerous, uh, and uh, it, it is certainly going to transform how we 
do things, how we know things, uh, but they say the same thing can be said about the internet. Uh, I remember when uh, TV came out, uh, uh, they, they said that uh, uh, schools will be closed and teachers will be fired because uh, what they could do is roll a TV in front of a classroom with uh, you know, the brightest, the best and brightest, and students would just learn, right? They'd learn from the best. And, the, <laughs> and of course, we saw how that worked out, right? Uh, and so AI is another tool, yes. Should we be concerned? Should we be worried? Should, are there, are there uh, issues? Of course, but certainly the internet, certainly TV, certainly the phone, uh, there are a lot of, uh, of pros and cons. But we must be careful and validate. So especially for our youth in particular, uh, the idea that uh, people are wildly using uh, ChatGPT to write papers uh, is, is, is not only distressing, uh, but if, it, if, it gets, if it's not controlled, it certainly could erode truly the uh, the educational well-being of our future generations, right? In other words, if they're not putting the hard work that we all had to write our papers, uh, and they are uh, also not even validating the information, it's a concern. So definitely use ChatGPT, but be careful. Definitely use gener generative AI, but be careful, uh, and make sure that you validate it like you would any other source. So. And then I was watch, watching on 60 Minutes, uh, the, the founder of, uh, of uh, AI, in his uh, very real warning that uh, global agreements must be made to protect humankind because ultimately uh, AI is getting to the point where it could get Terminator-ish, right? <laughs> in other words, AI is thinking logically and humans don't oftentimes <laughs> operate logically. Uh, and if, if nations are not in agreement to not create these autonomous, uh, you know, uh, ro robotic-driven AI agents, uh, you know, there could be a problem uh, because ultimately, again, our individual human values and uh, experiences, uh, again, oftentimes may not be what AI thinks should be uh, the norm or allowed uh, or, or acceptable. So, so this is a very real issue. Uh, it, it's something that. Uh, Again, I think similar, sim, similar to nuclear weapons uh, must be addressed uh, because it, it could become a real problem. All right, so with that being said, I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I know we have some questions. Um, and I think hopefully some questions in, in the virtuality world as well. So thank you very much. Appreciate thank you. It. But this is a conversation, so please, let's, uh, let's discuss. Yeah, so um, if does anybody have any questions they want to ask Dr. Chow? Um, so how many of you in the room have used AI in some way, ChatGPT or something else maybe? Just, just one? Two, I think, yes. <laughs> Two? OK, great. Um, I'm curious uh, if people in the room have uh, feelings about AI, you know, or is there Maybe if you haven't used it, like, is there a reason why you're hesitating, or you just haven't had a chance to try it, or any any thoughts on that? I would say I'm, I'm hesitant to use it because it's new and it's different. Um, so, you know, I don't know how logical it is, but it's, it's new. So mm. I'm just hesitant to adopt something new. Right, and that's, that's, that's pretty common, right? People have, when there's a new technology introduced to them or any kind of change, people hesitate, they wanna think about it. Some people like to think about it longer than others. So would you say that's your experience with, with other kinds of changes? Again, I think that uh, not to be an alarmist, the, again, Poole's principle of least effort means that 
people are going to use it. And, and yeah. the less mature you are, I think the, the less responsibly you're going to use it. So it is a real, it's a real concern as far as that misuse. Uh, that that could yeah. be a that could be a, a significant problem. So. What? Yes, please. Okay. No, I, it's a, uh, yeah, I, th I think my general approach is to lead into it and to use it as another resource, right? Um, don't, don't try to ban it. You know, I think especially for, for youth, the more you try to keep them from doing something, <laughs> right, the more likely. But I think it's responsible use, right? Uh, and I think, uh, in my opinion, maybe show them examples of, of how wrong it can be, right? Give them some examples of that. Uh, and then uh, impart to them that if you run with incorrect information, what that could mean for you, right? And then how you live and, and how you talk to people and the decisions that you make, if they're based on wrong information, uh, you know, I, in my mind too, and of course it's maybe not for the youth, but that, that's, isn't that the definition of being a person, right? Mm -hmm. An individual. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you don't want to give those up to AI, right? You don't want to. You don't want to give that up to a machine, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, would you say your experience, um, you know, with the students that you work with, that they are? I know you. You tend to work with students that are. Um, they're very eager about technologies and trying new things. But generally speaking, from what you're hearing around campus, do you feel that students are diving into this, or they are? Yes, mm -hmm. I think I think they are. And again, principles principle of least effort, right? Uh -huh. So. Um, and, it, and it's not a moral challenge as much as it is, or at least not initially, but you know, uh, being a graduate student, uh, and for most of our students are graduate students, is a lot of work, right? And you're, you know, they have families, they're working professionally, and, and this is, and this is always something due. So the, the temptation slash necessity, right, to use that tool is, I think, almost unavoidable, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why we've leaned into it, use it, <clears throat> but cite it. Right. And, and, and of course, for our students, you know what plagiarism looks like, which is you've got to cite it. You've got to put quotes behind it. You can't just make that your paper. Right. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And by the way, uh, uh, turn it in and, you know, all of the other you know, defenses that we have, they already have that. Right. And so uh, and so that's partly what we tell students, too, is that it, we're checking. We already the systems are already checking for it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, do you think that Obviously, this is changing the way that students might be approaching their assignments um, and how people in general are, are approaching their work, how they're going to maybe take some shortcuts. Maybe that's a good thing in, in many cases. Uh, maybe it's a bad thing sometimes. How, is, how are the institutions going to have to change to account for this change in how people are working? Say, you know, with, um, you know, people starting to just rely on ChatGPT to get work done faster, they're not really looking at what it's outputting, they're just turning it in as their work. Um, how, how, does, uh, how does the education system respond to a world like that? I think, uh, I think it's, uh, it could be a cup half full. Um, so the way I use it and the way I think a lot of our colleagues use it, we're able to produce, I think, stronger work because a lot of that initial draft or having chat GPT to give you advice on XYZ mm -hmm. is very helpful, right? And I say, I would think for students the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in, in technology and software engineering, for example, as you probably have heard, you know, a lot of the traditional coders are gone, right? Those positions are, are gone. However, because their AI is, being, is able to be used, arguably, you're able to do more. Right, You're, because that part of it now, that delay, the cost of it now has been removed. Right, so uh, a cup half full would say that that means that our software and other things 
are going to be more advanced. So I think for our students, that would be, I think, what we would say to them is that you can create even stronger works, right? Use chat GPT, use published peer-reviewed research, mm -hmm. and you will now have more time, right? Remember, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure most of you remember um, world, well, only a few of you remember the world without computers, right? But you remember the good old typewriter, right? <laughs> well, having Word and WordPerfect, how much more pro productive are we with that, right? <laughs> exactly. And so, and so that's the way I see it too. I think this is, I think this is another knowledge uh, revolution, right? I, I really think that 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 our productivity, uh, the the works, the quality. I mean, a lot of AI art, for example, is just amazing right and i really do think it's going to push push it further so yeah so a little story on typewriters and computers so when i was in junior high um, the school got some computers and all the kids that were in the typing class that i was in it was a full year of typing so the halfway through the class we were just using typewriters then the computers came in and then the error rate skyrocketed as soon as we got that delete key right. and it was interesting because it was like on one hand, the students were failing the class, but on the on another hand, um, nobody ever really went back to typewriters, right? We moved on and we were able to do more. So yeah, no, that's yeah. a great point. I think going back to, to the question, ma'am, your your question, I think I was just thinking, thinking critically, right? Because uh, I kind of kind of tied to what you were saying. So I think. Thinking critically, if we're not educating and teaching students how to think critically in the world of AI, uh, then, then one, we're gonna miss an opportunity, and two, I think we're gonna see the erosion of critical thinking because we're letting AI make a lot of decisions. Whereas we wanna say, okay, let AI do this, but now you need to interpret its, its responses mm -hmm. so that you can think at a higher level, right? Because a lot of that work has been done, so. Yeah, I, I, I kinda wonder if the, um the, the essay and the, the written um, project are doomed, right? Because how are we gonna know if a student really did learn and, and really has you know, brought that learning into their thinking and so that they can, they can express it? Yeah, I was, I was thinking, uh, remember the good old undergraduate days, the blue book? <laughs> I can see you pulling out the blue book. They say, write, write your interpretation of your essay, right? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was thinking that, Yeah. Um, but there was no way to communicate Right, right. Yeah, and by the way, I would encourage us to, to lean in, not lean away. Uh, we're seeing this in a lot of areas. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I definitely understand it. And then cognitively, when you're writing, you know, that's, that's good learning. But uh, yeah, I would, encourage, I would encourage us to embrace it and, and use it as a positive, but, but not try to, you know, unplug everything and go back to blue, <laughs> right? Because I think although it's well-intentioned, it's, miss, it's missing an opportunity. Not, not to mention the environmental resources involved, right? And <laughs> pencils and lead and paper and, you know, those kind of things, so. Yeah, so, um, you know, here at Palo Alto, the library is kind of in the lead with AI in terms of our city and how the city staff work. Um, we're gonna be doing a brown bag with city staff next week um, to talk about AI in the workplace. Um, to learn how people are using it and get ideas. I do know that in our own situation at the library, we've been using it for data analysis and a few other projects, and it's letting us do things that we would never be able to do, things that were way beyond the capacity of our staff, our limited staff, to be able to accomplish. So it's really great in, in that regard. Um, so I'm curious from any, anyone else in the room, like any experiences um, using uh, AI of any kind, ChatGPT or otherwise? Um, any insights or thoughts on it? Mm -hmm. You know, when someone comes with a much more 
a typical presentation, suddenly the AI has um, no experience with that, and so the diagnostics is very poor, whether an experienced or a mid-career clinician would be able to pick up something like that. So I think it does have its uses, but I think it has such limitations that we have to be aware of those limitations. Right. It's almost like a new skill that, that people have to learn in order to, to work with it, right? Yeah, that's right. There's a field in, our, in, in library information science called prompt, prompt engineering. So mm -hmm. one of the, the new skills is making sure you prompt AI in a way that will be the most productive, right? So yes. Uh, the uh, live stream can't hear the audience. Oh, okay, sorry. So let me repeat the question then. So um, one of the audience members was talking about how you know she works in the medical field and and people are finding AI to be very helpful at at you know doing their jobs but there are some limitations that are important to understand um, and it's maybe not so creative sometimes or it doesn't it doesn't think out of the box that it can only understand what it's been trained on that's right that's right and again I was going back to Ryan your point about using data so again I think what we're going to see uh, our, our AI and software that's going to test the results of AI, right? And, right? and the reason why it's so important is because, again, AI can do things that we can't do, which means that we can't check it either, right? Mm -hmm. So if it inserts, right, if it, if it, if it uh, you know, it's going to fail, right? There's right. going to be a blip, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, so that's my caution, right? Yes, it does that, but if it's doing things we can't check, then, then that's also very dangerous, right? So, yeah, which is why, of course, there's got to be AI to check AI, right? So, so from your experience, how do you see uh, people who haven't jumped into AI or maybe they're just beginning? Like, how do they learn these things, like prompt engineering and 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 being able to uh, recognize the the faults, the the weaknesses in AI? I think most technology, I always get asked that question about technology, and my, my recommendation is just use it to improve your quality of life, right? So in other words, use it as a companion or a, an assistant. So uh, a couple of months ago, uh, one, of, one of our admins uh, uh, asked if I should use ChatGPT, if they should use ChatGPT to write thank you notes to donors. I'm like, no, <laughs> we cannot use AI to, re for, for, in other words, I cannot re remove my individual, right, uh, mm -hmm. independence mm -hmm. for doing that. So, but yeah, I, that's the answer is use it as, and use it to improve your quality of life. Use it to be more efficient. Uh, mm -hmm. Use it to write a thank you note for, uh, you know, maybe for a, a babysitter if you don't have time, right? So that, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Oh, and I hate to say it right. Writing uh, Christmas cards to family members that you don't have time to. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, an assist, right? So, yeah. Not to you, Sandy. It's always. <laughs> yes. How do we know what training sets? Are being used is that is there transparency that's built into that because it seems like that would really make, like the, the DI issues and things like how do, how do we know that what it's drawing from is good sources? Yeah, that that's a great question, and, and I I maybe we could repeat the question. Yeah, so the question was how do we know what uh, AI is training on? What resources is it pulling from? Uh, uh, and that is a really good question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. That, that is, a, that is a, a question that is asked at pretty much every conference that I go to, right? What, what, um, yeah, what, what, how many citations do you need before AI is going to pay attention to your work, right? And, and, and I don't, uh, the scary thing is that m most people can't answer that question. <laughs> they don't. I, I think yeah. like search engines, like Bing versus Google, you know you're going to get different results. Right. On which one, based on how they decide to sort things out. Yes. I assume AI is going to work the same way. That's Absolutely. Ways it tries to use. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I remember uh, having this conversation at the last I conference, and, uh, and the conversation was, okay, well, let's look at the the ethnic and gender background of, of software engineers, right? And it was white and Asian males. And so... Mm -hmm. That's not a diverse group, right? But there, but those are the engineers that are teaching AI, right? And so, what's the like? What's the likelihood that's a very biased perspective on the world, right? Big problem, right? And then, and some of you came in later, but my, I begun the talk with asking how many people were published, uh, and the bottom line is, if your your ideas and your 
research and your lessons that you can teach us are not published, AI can't access it. And so you're not part of that data set. That's a huge problem, big problem, right? Big problem. Yeah, so how do we, how do we get to that place where the, the public has more of a say in the decisions that are being made at, in these companies, right? They're pretty much all companies at this point. I think it's got to be, it's going to have to be policy and regulation. Uh -huh. I mean, I think there's definitely going to have to be policy reg regulations on the use of AI uh, and when it's allowed, you know, the, those kind of things. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. But I think, again, the other is to always triangulate. triangulate. Don't overuse AI. Don't over rely on AI. There's, there's too many problems. And again, you'll, a lot of the architects basically say, I, we don't really know. We don't really know. AI is learning. We don't really know what it's accessing. We don't, we're not sure any longer, right? And so that's, yeah. So you mentioned some really positive outcomes that could come from this, right? So it's in this really super empowering technology. It's going to let humans do things faster, right? Bigger than before. Um, but the flip side of that, like you alluded to, there are some some Terminator type scenarios. What what do you think is like a realistic um, doomsday scenario with AI that, that keeps you up at night? <laughs> well, uh, again, I was watching, and I'm I'm forgetting his name. I apologize. But it was on 60 Minutes, and he was just talking about how, and he did end up at that was like the concluding uh, comment, mm -hmm. is that AI is trained to learn and is trained to be logical, right? And that is, again, at odds with a lot of what we know to be human, right, and individual and our preferences. It's actually the quirkiness of it, right? And so the doomsday scenario is that AI, you know, like the Terminator mm -hmm. idea, is that it's going to start running itself and basically say, you're not useful, you're not useful, you're not useful, you know, you don't, you know, I'm much smarter than you, why, do, why, why are you needed, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the, the doomsday scenario, and again, what he was saying, is that just like, again, nuclear, nuclear weapons and other things, companies have to, uh, or countries have to agree, you cannot connect, you know, that kind of uh, generative AI with, you know, robotics, where you're, you know, now giving it a form in mm -hmm. which it can really start, you know, autonomously making decisions. And that's what, basically what he was saying. You, we've got, you've got to, we've got to make those limits where we cannot allow AI that, that, that way out. But on the flip side, you think about terrorism and, and you know, people doing illegal things. I, I kind of, I think it's almost impossible in a way, right? So, mm -hmm. so yeah. So the doomsday scenario is that it gets out of control and that it no longer relies on us, right? Yeah. And it basically is just making decisions. And again, what does that look like? Well, again, it could start its own company and it can build its own, right? I mean, and so anyway. So right. yeah. So getting it, it getting out of control is a doomsday scenario. But I do think, very seriously. It, there, it is at odds with, I think, a lot of what makes us human, right? And that's the big problem with machines and AI, is that, that you can see very quickly, it's going to look at us and say, why do I need you, <laughs> right? Or, you know, you're not Stop as smart as I Stop asking me so many questions. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? And so, yeah. That's right, yeah. He was always in tears, right? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Wanted to um, have him or itself kill his wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so we might need to repeat that for the folks online. Yeah. So, so uh, <laughs> that, that example was brought up. Uh, I think one of the one of the well publicized interactions a reporter had with uh, with AI, and, and uh, he struck a great friendship, and he. He said the, the initially the AI agent was so eloquent, almost brought him to tears, and then it turned dark, uh, where where it's you know started to get angry, and I I can't remember the murder part, but basically that it suggested that they murder his wife, right? mm -hmm. <laughs> and so yeah, so that's so the lack of I think the lack of control, Ryan, right, in the in the idea that you have an autonomous machine, uh, you know, AI driven, independent being. Right, that's, that's, yeah. and, and again, already you're, the creators are saying they're not sure what it's doing. They're not sure what it's accessing, right? Because of the internet, right? It's, 
it's consuming, right? And, right. and so already they're saying that they're not sure, uh, and and so yeah. Yeah. Any other questions for Dr. Chow? Yeah. Best case, best case scenario is, is that uh, we understand the doomsday scenarios and just start cutting them off, mm -hmm. right? C cutting them off. I think also uh, some, I got some nods in the audience. As far as we know, some people are going to probably do bad things, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, therefore there must be protections against those as well, right? Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it can it can discover new medicine. It, I think it can it can solve it can solve problems like cancer and other things that we simply can't do because it can analyze data sets and at least come up with theories that we would have never thought of. Right? I think the humans have to then take that data and test it out like we would in a scientific study. Another one uh, I just saw I saw my dad my parents have turned me on the 60 Minutes uh, is is that they they are using 3D printing now in combination with AI, where they're basically saying that they can build uh, these, um, uh, these stations on Earth and Mars completely autonomously, right? Imagine that, mm -hmm. imagine that. And again, they're talking about the fact that uh, they think the future of manufacturing is 3D printing, right? Using environmentally friendly material, the cost go down, the waste goes away, uh, is good, decreases, and we have a healthier Earth, right? And, uh, and you know, when you think about environmental crises, I'm hoping AI is going to help us with that, right? Is uh, to understand things that we can't uh, and consume and, and problem solve, you know, 24/7, where we need sleep, right? Which goes back to the Terminator thing, right? So, but so we're getting a, a few questions online. Yeah. One in uh, Mozilla Hubs sure. is. Um, it's it's a it's a long statement, but I essentially I think it boils down to this idea of alignment that we will develop AI so that it aligns with human values, um, and so that w if we can achieve alignment, then we kind of overcome some of these these issues where uh, the AI decides that it's just going to do away with these pesky humans. Yes, um, because it's value it's actually trained on our values. Yes, I agree. And I think going back to, to your question, I, I the other thing I could see is the AI personal assistant, right? Mm -hmm. The AI assistant that that just learns on you uh, and knows you, right? And, and and can provide support for you, right? And I I think that 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 would be I think a you know a companion, right? A companion, a, a friend, a, a, you know. Um, so I think that that would be a positive. Someone, someone. I mean, don't we all sometimes think we really could use a personal assistant, right? We could really. Could you just balance a checkbook? Can you just pay those bills? Can you just <laughs> can you just order the groceries? I mean, I got. You can kind of see AI, you know, at some point, hopefully, uh, doing that. So yeah. yeah, overspending too, I'm sure. But, yeah. So another question. This one on YouTube. Um, uh, so who do you think uh, should lead the, the charge for AI policy? And then they, they talk about how Congress, you know, in recent hearings, say, such as the, the TikTok hearings, seem to not really have a clue about the technology. Um, so I think oftentimes there's a, uh, there's a problem with the legislators who are going to write these laws. They, they may not really be up to speed on the technologies that they have to regulate. So. How do we fix that? Uh, by voting. <laughs> I mean, in all seriousness, it, it, uh, it, that is one of the beauties of democracy, right? Mm -hmm. Is that I think uh, uh, the, the informed legislators, uh, so if this becomes a legislative priority, we have to vote, right? We have to vote for people that have, have the understanding to do that. And also on the flip side, <laughs> In all seriousness, uh, having, having the privilege of work, uh, advocating and, and meeting a lot of legislators, they have very strong staff, right? So, so even if they may not be that, that educated, uh, they typically have a pretty strong staff that will do the research. Uh, and, uh, and again, maybe, just maybe, it's going to go the, the wrong way. AI could actually maybe help the legislator as well. In uh -huh. fact, uh, a number of people in meetings now, they actually use AI to summarize the meeting agendas to give you the action items, right? And you know, just maybe, maybe the legislators can uh, use an AI uh, agent to, to 
noodle on this problem, right? right. To, to give me pros and cons. Maybe they'll actually understand the laws that they're. There we they're, go. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. That have been written for them. Right. Exactly. Or AI say, "Oh, wait a minute, you can't do that." <laughs> right. <laughs> so. So another question online. Rosine's asking. Um, uh, do you? This is about uh, the library profession. Do you think uh, we would see in the near future new positions like AI librarian? AI trainer and such. 100%. Yeah, I think the whole idea of prompt engineering uh, is, uh, and, and, I, and that that is that is a thing a, a, that companies are paying really a, a lot of money for, right? Mm -hmm. I think uh, the last pr presentation I saw was like a, you know at least $150,000 or more. So, so yes, that, absolutely. And I think that AI is going to be, I think, used more in digital preservation. AI is definitely going to be used to uh, do a lot of. Uh, uh, the, maybe the more mundane tasks in, mm -hmm. in, li in libraries as well as other other fields as well. So yeah, hundred percent. And again, training is going to be a big part of that. Right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Like the digital literacy angle, right? Absolutely. And, and getting back to what you made the point you made about democracy and, and voters. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, giving voters the um, uh, exposure to technologies so that they can vote. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, with a uh, little knowledge behind their vote. Absolutely, and yeah. I think you mentioned literacy. I think again, that that should be part of what we're teaching our youth, right? So we we teach them how to read, but we also have to be teaching them these values and these these concerns as part of their growth, right? Um, because cybersecurity, right? That's a big issue for all of us with our phones. Uh, in, in connect, you know, constant connection to the internet, <laughs> AI is going to take that to a whole nother level, right? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, a little plug for our library. So we have been doing some AI programs here, um, largely just introducing people to the tools to try them out, to talk about the experience going into it, like kind of checking in where they are when they show up and then letting them try it out and then having conversations like this to um, let them reflect on what they've seen and, and, and what they're thinking now. Um, yeah, I agree. I, I think it's it's really important. The, the world's changing so fast. We need we need places for um, the public to be able to get together and talk about these things and catch up. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to show too, uh, and, and I thank all the students that helped me build this. So this is my virtual reality resume, <laughs> right? And, and uh, I've challenged the uh, all of our high school students that have one of these when they hit the job market um, because. Virtual reality, you know, allows us to communicate so much more, right? Uh, and of course, uh, like I mentioned, the AI agent's not here, but imagine having a, convers a conversational agent of yourself in a virtual reality space that can actually serve as almost like a docent to, to your experience, right? <laughs> and again, it's just a, another way of communicating, which I think is really exciting. Mm. Um, because uh, you remember, uh, uh, the only way we could uh, distinguish ourselves and with our resume was what rose-colored or you know, the, the, <laughs> the, the bond, right? Right. <laughs> now we have a lot more at our disposal, right? So, but anyway. So, um, so you also talked about how the power of AI to recognize patterns that we may not see. Um, maybe you could kind of elaborate on that a little bit more, and 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 just in terms of like us seeing things that we didn't even know were there before, um, maybe in good ways and bad ways. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't have any specific examples in mind, but what, what I mean by that is the, the sheer processing power of AI, right? Mm -hmm. To take a body of knowledge, and, and more and more now, so we're certainly libraries are trying to do this too, uh, and, and digital preservation as well. Uh, so, you know, the Microsoft example, right? Uh, so taking, taking all of our classics, using AI to sift through to identify themes, right? So the humankind, we would do that, uh, for the most part, qualitatively, you know, in Excel, and we'd be coding things and adding, th and, and that is, you know, compared to what we have now is really not viable. Um, so, but then again, medicine, I think problems, uh, you hear about, uh, and again, AI for, uh, for the um, uh, creation of homes using 3D printing, it just enables us to analyze and, uh, and interpret and use data you know, cognitively. So mm -hmm. I think we can apply that in anything, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, again, it could apply it to ourselves and our own lives 
as well. So all of that discovery, so case in point, um, uh, what we're hoping to do with Seeking Mortality is to um, uh, interview uh, in Northern the Northern Cheyenne, they have less than 300 native speakers, to interview those elders uh, and then allow AI to sift through those stories to create a communal story, mm -hmm. right? And that's simply not possible right now. And so that, that's just, an, and again, when we talk about space travel and all of these other things, right? I mean, again, I think environmental, I'm sure we're gonna hear more and more about AI being used to, mm -hmm. to study the issues uh, around, around global warming and being able to analyze what that actually looks like and what could some possible solutions be. Mm -hmm. Before it was just you and I, buddy, but now we got AI, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you know, obviously we would, we would read and study, a whole team would read and study, we'd spend millions of dollars, you know, yeah, I can sift that, sift through that, at least give us alternatives, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, that's where I think the real beauty of this is gonna be, is it's, it's, they're gonna, it's gonna give us alternatives, mm -hmm. right? Alternatives that we may have never thought of that we can then apply our humanness to, right? So, right. yeah. Well, I think that's a great way to end tonight. Um, I wanna thank everybody for coming in today and, and sharing your thoughts. And I and, um, wanna thank you, Dr. Chow, for making the time to come. Absolutely. And, and be here with us and everybody online. I wanna thank you as well. Um, and so with that, I think we'll wrap up. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming.